Japan by River Cruise is made possible thanks to those who donate to the show at japanbyrivercruise.com and due to the generosity of our corporate sponsors. Today's sponsor is Toyota, official partner of the Olympic Games, who has asked us repeatedly to stop saying that on air. Hello, Brian, and welcome back to Japan by River Cruise. I'm Bobby Judo. And I'm Molly Horn. And joining us this week is Oscar Boyd, the host and producer of the Japan Times Deep Dive podcast, which joins us on the prestigious list of Japan's best marine leisure podcasts. It was a great episode on scuba regulator mouthpieces last week, Oscar. Thank you very much, and、uh, thank you very much for having me back on the show. On this week's show, the Western media has finally caught up with the Japan Twitter sphere. We saw that oh, you mean they... they've added the word gaijin to their Twitter handle?、Uh, no, I was going to say that they have. They're complaining been... about their loveless marriage? No.、Uh, I was going. They've been in Japan for 15 years and tweeted something yesterday about how they wouldn't be Hongo Jozu'd Bobby? No, stop it.、Uh, they're going crazy over Olympic <laughs> scandal stories. They... Ali, my wife should not have Jozu'd me. She shouldn't have. <laughs> What's the weekly River Cruise. <laughs> Damn it, Ollie! What's the what's the what's your recommendation? <laughs> well, this week's recommendation is a good one. It's a special chartered river cruise that is available exclusive to Amazon Prime members,、uh, which has been designed to remind customers of their impact of their choices on the environment and the steps that we as individuals can take to curb climate change.、Uh, so, suggestions that you'll learn on board include things like combining multiple orders into one delivery, recycling cardboard packaging where possible, and limiting recreational travel outside the Earth's atmosphere to only essential trips. I heard the、uh, boat looks. Like a dick. <laughs> <laughs> also, there's a fun and environmentally friendly way to get a cheap ride on the Tokyo Bay cruise. You pay full price when you get on, but when you get off, you can recoup 10 yen for every 500 grams of feces you help to clean out of the Olympic swimming venue. We'll tell you where to pick up some gloves and a net, but first, soap talk. <laughs> Brian, you're here again this week. I wouldn't say that. He's getting quite an attitude lately, isn't he? Well,、uh, anyway,、uh, Oscar, thank you for joining us again. It's been about a year since you were with us last. How have things、uh, developed for you and the Japan Times Deep Dive podcast over the last year? It's been a very exciting year. Just to talk personally, I、uh, I managed to break both my arms in May.、Mm, that is、that's、exciting.、True. Yeah, I didn't know if we were allowed to talk about that, but that's the reason we've not had you on sooner. <laughs> that you haven't、yeah. been able to hold a microphone. How did you break your arms? I uh, a, a woman on a mama cherry crossed a crossing in front of me on a red light while I was cycling along happily in the morning. Quick pause here. Some people won't know what a mama cherry is,、uh, okay. but it's important that they know because it makes this even more pathetic. <laughs>、uh, what's a mama cherry? Mama cherry is a it's a big heavy、uh, bicycle normally ridden by kind of <laughs>、uh, mothers who take their kids to school.、Um, Hence the mama cherry, mama chariot, right? It's got a basket and,、uh, for for groceries and stuff on the front, and a child seat in the back, and and yeah, exactly, it, it, and some it, handlebars for plowing down foreigners.、Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I I hit her back wheel at full speed, flew off my bike into some of Tokyo's hardest concrete, and just、uh, shattered <laughs> both the radiuses in、uh, in my arms, which was、wow. quite impressive. Were her、yeah. children okay? Could you okay? get yourself up?、Uh, I could get myself up. I was just kind of in shock. At, at first, and、uh, I didn't know what to do with my bike, so I actually walked home from there, which took about twenty minutes, and then just kind of walked into the local hospital and said, "I think I've got a problem with my arms." Oh <laughs> and man! They, they proceeded to hand me paper form after paper form, saying, "Could you just fill this in?" <laughs> I said, "No, no, no! I think I've broken my arms." Said, and then just one form. We just need your details. I'm like, "I, I can't do kanji at the best of times right now." <laughs> That's, It's, really yeah. That's really、happen. funny. That's really funny. Oh yeah, this guy probably doesn't know, know, doesn't know how to write his own address. I Physically can't. My my calligraphy class didn't include putting a pen inside my mouth. <laughs> that's that's funny because at at normal times, like when you have a cold, I've always found that going to the hospital is one of the most uncomfortable situations as a foreigner because you still get that like, oh my gosh, it's a foreigner. What do we do? Reaction. But you're either in pain or very uncomfortable.、Mm. Like you're there for help. And so, anytime I like hand my insurance card to you know the the people at the counter, you hear a bunch of nurses in the back go. What should we do? What What's his name? How do we say that? What do we call him? Do Do you think he speaks Japanese? And they're like laughing and giggling about it. And you're like, in Oscar's case, you're like, my my arms are broken. Just, just see me. Take、please. care of me. 
<laughs> yeah. And and the doctor though was he was absolutely lovely, but it was this quite funny moment where like so I couldn't lift my hands anywhere near my face and I'd had a neighbor help me put a mask on and he came over and like fed me on a geary while I was waiting for my appointment. Um oh, but I got nice. in to see the doctor and the doctor was like, "Ooh, could you just pull up your mask?" And I kind of looked at him like no, I, I, I absolutely cannot. And uh, and he said, oh, oh, yeah, of course, you've broken both your arms and lifted it up for me. Um, <laughs> oh. But yeah, he was great. Uh, uh, did great one arm recover there. before the other? Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know where you're going with this joke. I'm not uh, going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I'm keeping this conversation straight out the gutter. <laughs> uh, they, they both healed pretty much simultaneously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well i i hate to take the conversation right back into the gutter but ollie i heard you're doing a show at the fringe this year <laughs> <laughs> yes uh, i'm not sure whether i'm delighted to announce or absolutely petrified to announce but uh it, it's been two years since i did a solo show at that festival uh for those of you that are not from the uk it's it's the biggest arts festival i think in the world i mean definitely in scotland definitely in the uk um, and every year, it's amazing. Ever since I first went, I just decided, right, I've got to be here every year. Obviously, there was a break last year, so I'm very pleased to be going back. Um, What's your show uh, called? Uh, the show is called Before After. And uh, sometimes when you haven't written a show, the best thing to do is to make the title vague. <laughs> and uh, in my instance, uh, <laughs> that that applies. Uh, but basically, I, I, got, I, got, I got a call about two weeks ago saying, we, we can get you a venue. It's not going to be a very big one. Uh, but but would you like to you know do you have a show ready and obviously I said yes and I mean any anyone that knows me personally knows that generally my kind of personal life and ability to be happy is currently like a big double thumbs down uh, and so I thought well at least this project will give me something to focus on and something that I enjoy uh, turns out uh, I'm absolutely petrified uh, I've got to I've got to do an hour an hour show every day for 25 consecutive days and tickets well, we're releasing this on friday tickets will have been on sale yesterday so as of now wednesday i don't know how many tickets uh i, I will have sold but i've got i've got about nearly two thousand to sell so uh, wow. if anyone uh, listening to this is, is going to be going to the edinburgh fringe festival uh or you know anyone that does and uh, you, you think i'm worth a shot then send them my way i'm looking at whether we can do a live stream one too so people can have a little look through the benefit of zoom your your previous shows have been very very well reviewed uh you've got uh, a quote here on your poster that i'm looking at that's a four-star review from broadway baby that says belly laughter inducing stories and mishaps and i like that it doesn't say stories about mishaps it says stories and mishaps which implies <laughs> <laughs> that the mishaps <laughs> are real they were, they were just describing the show yeah. just the whole show was a complete, complete mess well i'm glad it's even funnier because it's it's even funnier if you don't imagine that the belly laughter inducing is an adjective that's applied to both there it's just it's, it's applied to stories and mishaps is just an afterthought <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask about this poster and just uh, how it was created? Like, I hope you're going to put this somewhere as publicly as possible because it's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, well, do you, well, you, you want to describe much. it? Or, or well, I'm going to have to. So basically, the, the poster is me sat on one of those fitness balls uh, wearing shorts that were so skimpy I had to make the photographer sign something and uh, sweatbands that, that show off my lovely... Well, sweatbands and a top that shows off my lovely lady lumps. Um, and uh, there's a picture of me looking like I'm absolutely owning my physique. Well, this is very... <laughs> very flash dance this is like it's hot. like late 80s early yeah. 90s neon color fitness video exactly. yeah are you, are you holding a chicken wing uh yes holding a little piece of fried chicken <laughs> so uh, <laughs> but uh, due to an administrative error uh the the poster company in edinburgh so there's there's the company that kind of does all the promotion stuff and uh, without going into details they messed up and i got a call today saying we're going to give you three a zero size posters essentially for free so there's going to be essentially life-size uh ones of these around the edinburgh city center so i'll make sure to take a picture but if you're interested in seeing this absolute disaster of an image uh then uh, i'll put it on my twitter anyway uh oscar you've always been supportive of my comedy i remember you you uh, we talked about on the last show you reviewed the first ever comedy for caucus show and uh, i'm very pleased that, that you did and i'm very pleased that the pull quote that you gave me uh, wasn't actually a, a covert insult which i've now realized this poster <laughs> which is going to print is obviously insulting me um anyway so yeah bobby did we get any correspondence this week we did rachel bought us one coffee she said thanks for this podcast i love how you're so honest about the whole japan experience positive and negative uh which means she must have listened to the positive episode that we did <laughs> we also got a uh, mail from Brian with a Y. And Brian with a Y writes, I'm a newer listener and hope to one day make the Brian pilgrimage to Fukuoka. 
unless they spell their name differently, in which case I do not want to be associated with the Bryans with an I. Don't worry, Brian. Uh, the Bryans in Fukuoka don't know how to spell. <laughs> On that note, shall we jump into the news? Bobby Judo, what's in the news this week? Well, we are so tired of talking about Olympic stories that for a change, we thought it might be interesting to look at uh, the coverage of Olympic stories. Especially we've been seeing a lot of news about the Olympic bubble, the press bubble also. There's so many holes in the Olympic bubble that apparently Oscar was able to get in. Oscar, uh, I understand you're an accredited, a fully accredited journalist with a real show or whatever. Show us your lanyard. (laughs) <laughs> I'm uh, American Samoa's official journalist. Um, <laughs> it's in the next room. I can go get it if you want, but um, no. it would. Now, although to find out why Oscar is American Samoa's official journalist, this is a very good reason to listen to the extras this week if, if you're subscribed. But so you're somebody that lives in Japan, so it makes sense that you're covering the Olympics. I'm shocked by the amount of foreign journalists that are turning up. Like, I'm sure that there doesn't need to be this number of foreign journalists going to to do this kind of coverage do you have any idea of of numbers on the ground at the moment i don't have a precise idea of the number of journalists from of from outside of japan but i mean i think the total number of people coming to japan is around seventy thousand now of which right. eleven thousand are athletes i imagine the same again would be in support staff so there's got to be you know multiple thousands of journalists coming from other countries as well um which yeah considering the olympics boasts a lot about how well televised it is and nbc likes to remind us how much of a profit they're going to make you do think a lot of them could just watch it on tv right and and what are they actually reporting on uh, uh, <laughs> crowd crowd atmosphere <laughs> <laughs> hostile it's hostile to us <laughs> yeah i think there's just a sense that you kind of you kind of got to be there you yeah know, you've got to have the journalist who's locked in the hotel room saying here are all the measures in place and here's the experience. Well, that's the funny thing because these journalists aren't allowed to move around. It's not like proper journalism where you can go everywhere, is it? They are essentially stuck in a hotel room doing almost what they could be doing from their home country. Mm, for at least the first 14 days. Um, yeah, most of the clips so far I've seen, they've just got a beautiful backdrop of uh, Tokyo Tower and kind of seem, seem not, too, not too displeased with their situation. So before we get into um, some of our main themes this episode and talk about how nobody is following the rules and regulations, Oscar, can you tell us what those rules and regulations are? Uh, there are a lot. There are multiple, multiple handbooks that have been released over the past six months or so, which detail exactly all the different testing regimens and stuff like that. Um, and it really depends if you're a journalist to what level of contact you'll have with the athletes. I think if you're having direct regular contact with the athletes, you have to have daily PCR tests. If you have indirect contact, so maybe you're like talking with them from a distance, socially distance, um, then I think it's every four days. And if you have no contact, then you have to get tested every seven days. And this is the weird thing about going to these Olympics after living in Japan for a year is suddenly there's just this abundance of PCR tests. Mm. Um, right. That's where like they've been hiding them. Of PCR yeah. tests, which they were just like, take them, please take them. And they've gotten stingy with giving them out to, uh, to residents again, when you're in close contact or you're related to somebody who's come down with it. I've seen a lot of people on Twitter going, I was exposed and I need a PCR test and I can't get it. Mm. And in terms of the rule books and the guidebooks that are going out, another story that I've seen bandied about is, uh, is that a lot of the people who are coming in haven't actually downloaded the guidebooks or read them. Yes, I've seen those stories as well. And there's been kind of squadrons of uh, local Japanese journalists tailing uh, international journalists as they yep. kind of venture out around the city. And I think there's definitely been a couple of TV segments at various points where, um, you know, Japanese journalists have cons- confronted international journalists and said, have you read the playbook and when yeah. did you arrive in Japan? And they hadn't read it and they'd r- arrived very recently and kind of ignored the 14 day quarantine rule. Well, I've been following um, a bunch of tweet threads from Grace Lee, who's a COVID liaison for her media team. And she's also, like you, she lives here. She's been here, I think, for about a year and a half. But as as someone who's working in journalism who lives here, do you interact with any of the foreign media and kind of have a sense for how seriously they're taking it? So I haven't, I've only been to the media press, or I keep calling it the media press center. It's actually the main press center, NPC, which is this giant con- conference room in Tokyo Big Site down in Odaiba Mm. and so I've only been there once to pick up my accreditation and that was kind of before everything had kicked off 
Um, so I haven't interacted with people. We get it. You're accredited. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't interacted with um, journal other journalists that much at this point. Um, but I know journalists at other organizations that are based in Japan, a lot of them are being told to avoid the MPC just okay. to like, reduce any risk of exposure to journalists who have, um, you know, either skipped those quarantine mm. rules or, or might have some kind of exposure to the virus. What do you think might explain the apathy towards these rules? Because I'm worried that we might be kind of taken victim to the Japanese media's mm. plot, which is to say all these journalists are not following rules. But to be fair, I've seen some clips where clearly people that were fresh off the plane were going out drinking and showing a, a bit of a disregard. But firstly, do you think that it's lots of them? And secondly, what explains it? So first, I think I'd like to say I, I do believe it's probably the mi minority of journalists. I think most people who will be coming here will be very aware of, or maybe not very aware, but quite aware of how popul unpopular the, Jap uh, the Olympics is in Japan and right. will be doing their best to stay within those guidelines. Um, as to the apathy, I guess it's a combination of what your own experience of COVID's been like at home, combined probably with the fact that they've almost certainly been vaccinated. Um, not everyone has been vaccinated, but I assume most of the journalists who are here will have been vaccinated. And I guess people are thinking, oh, I'm vaccinated. I pose no risk. I'm no danger to anyone. Right. Um, so maybe the rules don't apply to me so much. I think a lot of us, when we started to see uh, the Western press really kind of start to focus in on on the build up to the Olympics and, and everybody start to come over here, starting with that uh, BBC video that they produced about let's go to Tokyo. Um, we started to see kind let's of the go let's go there. Yeah, let's the, go there. Yeah, that's right. By the way, that's being played all the time on the TV. Is it? Yeah. What's the reaction to it in, over there? Well, so uh, it's funny. I, I was watching the TV with my mum. But so remember, I lived in Japan for a number of years and she never visited me. And I said, <laughs> does that make you want to visit Japan? And she went, oh, not really. It seems a bit noisy. <laughs> and, so, and so I, I don't know if it's if, if it's having the, the effect that uh, the BBC are expecting, but it is played all the time. I've seen yeah. it at least five or six times. And starting with that advertisement, I think that was when a lot of us who live here were really kind of reminded that, oh, this is going to be a period where we get all of the Japan tropes thrown in our face. And one of them is uh, Wacky Sex Japan. And we saw this huge explosion in the anti-sex bed stories uh, the last week. It, it self-corrected pretty quickly, I thought. I was impressed with how quickly it self-corrected. But Oscar, do you think these foreign journalists who are coming over with their non-native lens, with their kind of limited experience lens, do you think they're creating a proliferation of English language content about Japan that might contribute to this? I'm sure they are. I think most, I, I think a lot of journalists will be trying to look for the kind of positive, interesting, not necessarily sports angle to the Olympics to try and get other people hooked. And I think yeah. all of these little stories will, will pop up and uh, provide ample fodder for these, these kind of vi super viral stories to go. Well, let, um, let's talk crazy. about the sex bed story because it, it's one of these ones which it, it very, very quickly did the rounds. Some very, very high profile people just, just took it. And I mean, firstly, it's one of these stories where if you just think about it for a bit, it's like, well, obviously that can't be the reason. For those that don't know, the story was uh, Tokyo had decided to create cardboard beds because the original impetus was it, the Olympics is going to be sustainable. It's wasteful to go to Ikea and buy loads of beds or whatever they normally do. Mm. Um, turns out, I, th I think we might have talked about this uh, off the podcast, but it turns out it was it cost them more than regular beds anyway because it was a consultancy and a design agency that made them right like, this is like the most expensive cardboard in the world so in <laughs> in, in, in any respect t like terrible but rather than digging back and looking four or five years ago when this was decided the story was we've got to quickly link this to covid we've got to quickly link this to all the concerns plus as bobby said there's a a, a, a japan sex angle and they just forgot that you can have sex on the floor and and ran with this so hard they maybe won a medal for running. They were, they were supposed to be anti-sex because of the weight limit. And it was like the weight only supports one person's body weight. And if two people try to get on the bed, uh, it'll collapse. <laughs> that that was a detail that was included in that story. But in my and experience, that's true of regular beds. So even that's not an argument. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I mean, somebody made the point that like, you know, a 16-year-old gymnast is not going to weigh the same as a 22-year-old judoka. Like, they're, they're Olympic athletes. They're weightlifters that'll be sleeping on those beds that 
that weigh as many as as that weigh as much as two smaller people having sex. Also, also if anyone's flexible enough to have sex in interesting positions, it's going to be Olympians, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one of my one of my uh favorite interactions on our twitter account is i just i saw all of these stories going out and i just tweeted just a standalone tweet that said a lot of you have never fucked on a pile of boxes and it shows and we got a bunch of people who just didn't know what i was referencing <laughs> just <laughs> like, i was like what <laughs> but but yeah i think this story typ typifies it that yeah as as I think people are obviously not that excited about the host country because the host country is not excited about it. And so that they, they can't do the, you know, legions of Japanese supporters looking Japanese, flying Japanese flags, being kawaii, going, yay, yay, yay. Nor can they interact with the athletes because they don't have the access. So you just you just got to gotta find these other angles. And if they come from absolutely nowhere, then it doesn't matter because you've, you've still met your filing deadline. Mm, totally. But I think why it was so effective is because it... Uh fit into a narrative a real narrative that had been established which was around that condom story how the mm, ioc were right, distributing right. 160,000 condoms to athletes but saying please only use them when you return home um and so i think it led from that story about the condoms straight into this sex bed story with um yeah you know the ioc did someone run the numbers on the 160,000 because based on what you've told us there's only 70,000 people who've come in I yeah, well, use well, so if it's only I use a different to, phrasal verb. Yeah. Um, who have entered the country? <laughs> so that means it's it's two each. I I can't remember the details of whether that was one hundred sixty thousand condoms for eleven thousand athletes. In which case, it's more like sixteen each. Um, probably which, haven't got much time to compete. Well, I mean, <laughs> exactly. really, really, I mean, they should be giving, they should be giving. 31 condoms to athletes who won medals and won to everybody who did it. <laughs> <laughs> and also, let's presume that it's the athletes that are coupling with each other. Presumably, you need half as many. Because you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't, you, you both don't bring them, do you? And Janken to decide which one to use. You, uh, you're looking at me as if I've not had sex before. <laughs> I think we're, we're getting a, is that, is that a real <laughs> clear window into what you're imagining goes on in the Olympic Village. It has to be. It has to be an absolute filth fest. Yeah, I, I wouldn't I mean, blame and we Didn't we see, who was it to, that, that created that Twitter thread? Someone had gone on Bumble and found just hundreds and hundreds of, of horny oh. people going, fresh off, fresh off the boat, here for work. Well, looking to, you know, I, I don't know, share my Olympic rings with you. I don't know what, what they said, but, you know, it's <laughs> uh, I really enjoyed seeing this story on Twitter. Um, I got married before there were dating apps. I never got to use Tinder or Bumble, but but I see everybody, like, building their profile as they get here. I think a lot of them are people working in the media. So you'll see they were sharing, like, screenshots of, you know, I work in the media. I'll be working here for a little while, would like to meet. But then I did get the sense that some of them also were, like, athletes that had created profiles. And it was so funny because they were describing themselves, and it would be, like, like their description and then sporty and i'd be like give yourself a little bit of credit mate <laughs> like, <laughs> like don't be so modest <laughs> I, I there was a kind of um you know a lot of people weren't totally upfront about acknowledging that they were the they were there with the olympics but you know it was clear they were and yeah. it'd be like works at sports event works at <laughs> international global <laughs> sports event and then just flew into Japan. And I think everyone who's lived here for the last two years has realized, or year and a half has realized, you can't just fly into Japan anymore unless you were here yeah. to start with. Or here before the yeah. pandemic, you're, you're basically stuck if you want to come to Japan, unless it's the Olympics. There's this idea that the press is limited in the access that they have to traditional you know, sporting reporting stories. But because of that, they might be looking for Japan-focused angles. They might be looking for different kinds of angles. And one thing that I've seen a lot of online so far is this kind of fire festival angle where a lot of people are posting mm. pictures of the disappointing uh, way that Japan is running things. I think I saw one about a, a burger, a French journalist reporting on you know the 1,600 yen, the $16 rubber meat burger that they were serving in the Olympic cafeteria. Well, so yeah. I think this was at the main press center as well. And if you look at the venue layout of the main press center, I think there's only one restaurant for the people who are staying there mm. or the people who are working there. And it's just called the burger and pizza restaurant. <laughs> and I was just thinking, how disappointed would you be if, you know, you had turned up 
to the Olympics and you'd heard all about Japan's fantastic food culture and everything that was on offer. And the only thing you could eat was pizzas and burgers for the entire time、mm. you were in Japan.、Yeah. And I just wonder whether it was, it was like a, you know, a bunch of suits going, What do Guy Cockerjin like to eat? <laughs> I've heard pizza. Yeah, buddy. And, yeah, buddy. Some burgers. Yeah. Burgers. <laughs> Yeah. But this does speak more generally to this idea that Japan, well, I mean, one thing that Japan is really good at is creating this impression, this soft power that it's got its shit together. And even someone like my mum, who hasn't been to the country, just thinks of it as clean and futuristic and well organized. And, you know, to many extents it is. But the Olympics is obviously showing some cracks. And The extent to which they're able to execute successfully in the Olympics will affect how people, how people around the world think of Japan.、Mm-hmm. And, and Oscar, are you not, not worried that if Japan doesn't reach the standards that they've set themselves, this difficult second, an- second album problem, right? <laughs> that Japan is so good at claiming that they're good at running things. If they can't reach those standards, are they going to have a problem in years to come? I don't think so. I, I、okay. think people will, for, will forgive Japan for trying to host this event in the COVID 19 pandemic and just say,、right. well, maybe residents of Japan won't forgive mm. Uh, mm. Japan for hosting this pandemic. But I think people overseas will probably go, oh, what a brave effort that they actually managed to、mm. get through it and get to the end of it. Well, I, I don't know because the extent to which they do not have their shit together is not only being covered by the media, we're also seeing all the athletes participating and kind of sharing, just like we saw in Sochi, where athletes were sharing pictures of their hotel rooms, how things were horrible, the conditions were bad. We've already seen、um, the Iranian team. Had、their Instagram story about not getting picked up at the airport and having to wait 12 hours. Things are so bad. I heard a member of the Ugandan team had to book his own Shinkansen ticket. <laughs> Hey, thanks very much for listening to this episode 92 of Japan by River Cruise. And thank you to everybody who continues to support the show. And not only this show, but Bobby, we've got some news, haven't we? Yes, Ali and I have worked very hard to create a video, the first ever Japan by River Cruise rundown video about all of the reasons why the Tokyo 2020 Olympics are fucked.、Uh, if that video is not up today, it's because our Production process is fucked. So, hopefully, you should be able to find it on our YouTube channel, on my YouTube channel at Bobby Judo. Check it out and let us know what you think. Oscar, thank you so much for joining us.、Uh, good luck with your reporting on American Samoa. Thank you very much. And if you want an audio only version of a very similar、uh, Olympic focused podcast, then please check out the Deep Dive podcast from the Japan Times. Thank you. And thanks to everybody for listening. We will see you next week.